from uh, resources. And without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Lizzie Lowe. Thanks so much, Liz. Um, so my name is Lizzie. Um, I'm from CESA Australia. I'm the lead of the extension team um, at CESA. Uh, if you haven't heard of us before, we're an independent research company and we specialise in um, integrated pest management, biosecurity and conservation. And one of our real focuses is beneficial insects. So we're always talking about um, the types of insects we can be having in our crops and our food production systems that can be helping us to control pests. Uh, and we're very, very lucky today to have a specific interest in parasitoids. And we've got the lovely Sam Ward, who's joining us, who, as you'll hear about today, has a long history in parasitoid research and an obvious passion. And I hope that you'll all um, enjoy the information that she has to share with us today. So, Sam, I will hand straight over to you. Um, while Sam's getting her slides organised, I'll just quickly give a reminder that if you could share which industry you're from in the chat, be really great for us to get an idea of um, of where you're from so we can yeah know who's in the room today thanks so much sam all right thank you lizzie all right no you haven't called into the wrong zoom meeting this is in fact my pathetic attempt of drawing an alien some of you may even recognize the film it comes from this is a scene from ridley scott's 1979 film alien and for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a science fiction film about a crew on a commercial starship that encounter deadly aliens who attack people, lay their eggs inside them and burst out. You wouldn't want to encounter one of these aliens in real life, would you? Now, what if I was to tell you that we have our own real life aliens here on Earth living among us? My name is Dr. Samantha Ward, and I'm a research scientist here at CESA Australia. And I'm going to talk to you today about parasitoids our very own real life aliens, said to have inspired the premise of that film, Alien. So let's start from the beginning. What are parasitoids? They're natural enemies of insect pests like predators and pathogens. Now predators eat the insect pests, their prey. They include things such as lady beetles, lace wings, hoverflies, Lizzie's favorite, spiders, we also have pathogens. These include various bacteria, fungi, viruses, and nematodes. And then parasitoids, this is my area. They're generally wasps, Hymenoptera, but they can also be found in flies and beetles, and also a type of worm. Now, parasitoids differ from parasites in that they kill their host during their development, whereas, say, a head louse or a tick doesn't. Now these terminologies, parasite and parasitoid, are often used interchangeably, which it isn't wrong, but you should know that these two different lifestyles are different. Now, many a beetle taxonomists will like to say that they have the group that is most diverse of all insects, but actually it's estimated that there are over half a million species of parasitoid wasp, many of which are undescribed. And you I mean you can see here from this picture, absolutely stunning, right? They're very variable, different antennae shapes and sizes, different colors. They can be metallic. They can have bright red eyes. They're just, oh, I love them. Uh, they can vary considerably in size from under a millimeter, some of them you can't see with the naked eye, to about five centimeters. And that's the spider parasitoids. However, when I tell people I work with wasps, generally people say, oh, I hate them, they sting me. They're thinking of things like the European wasp. But you can see here the size comparison. Parasitoid wasps are much, much smaller than the wasps that most people think about. Now, many adult parasitoids find their host by smell and they can detect either the direct odor of the host itself or odors associated with host activity such as plant damage through plant volatiles or dung, such as caterpillar frass. They use an ovipositor that you can see in this picture here. And this is a modified sting. Now, ovi meaning egg, positor meaning placing, positioning. And that's because they lay their eggs with this ovipositor into their host. And unlike the European wasp that I mentioned before, they generally don't sting. Now, occasionally they will paralyze their prey, but that's only certain types of wasps. The adults feed on nectar from plants, but also honeydew produced by insects. And they can also supplementary host feed. And that's feeding on fluids that exude from a puncture wound that they've pressed their ovipositor in. Kind 
they're gross. Now, there are two different types of parasitoid. These are called clonovoyant and idiobiont. Doesn't really roll off the tongue. Endoparasitoids or ectoparasitoids. Now, endo being in, the, the uh, parasitoid will lay its egg within a host. They don't usually sting the host when they do this. And they develop as their host feeds and grows, and they feed on it from the inside. Now, one example of this that I'll talk about later is the aphid parasitoid, aphidius, and that will do so within an aphid host. But then you have a different type of parasitoid, and that's the ectoparasitoid. That lays its egg on a host, not within a host. The adult generally does sting the host when it does this, and therefore the host is paralyzed or it just doesn't grow during the, the growth of the parasitoid. And the parasitoid will feed on the host from the outside. Now, one great example of this that you may have actually seen yourself is the spider parasitoid, a type of pompilid. Now, the advantage of an endoparasitoid, the one that develops within the host, means that it can grow larger as the host continues to grow, and it can also avoid predators because it's hidden away. Although this is not always the case, I'll mention later. Now, parasitoid wasps have very varied life cycles and they can attack different insects at different stages. Sometimes they can attack more than one stage, sometimes only one. They might attack one stage and emerge after, say, uh, an insect molts or pupates. And there may be many species within a single host. Now, I'm going to use an example that you may be aware of, the helicoverpal wasp, uh, sorry, moth. I've got moth, wasps on the brain. So this is a, a diagram here of a moth life cycle. Now, we'll start with the first wasp. This is trichogramma. This is an egg parasitoid. It lays its eggs within the moth's eggs and emerge. Quite simple. But then we have another wasp. This is Micropletus, and this is a larval parasitoid. The female wasps can parasitize approximately 70 Helicoverpa caterpillars in their lifetime, so they can be really, really effective at controlling them. Now, the wasps have a preference for the second instar, but they can also parasitize third and fourth instars, although less frequently because the caterpillar can defend itself and actually can kill or uh, injure that wasp. Then we have another wasp, Copidosoma, which is an egg larval parasitoid. And the wasp lays its egg into the, uh, the egg of the host, uh, the moth. And after the caterpillar hatches, the wasp's uh, egg then produces as many as 3,000 embryos through cloning and feeds on the inside of that host. We then have another wasp, Natelia. This is a larval pupal parasitoid. So it lays its eggs inside the caterpillar. It temporarily paralyzes the caterpillar by stinging it, but the adult wasp doesn't emerge until after the caterpillar has pupated. And finally, we have the ichneumon. This is a pupal parasitoid. The adult wasp emerges from the pupal case by chewing off the head section and leaving it via an emergence tunnel. This actually won't be seen because it'll be underground. But what you can see here is just with one insect host species, you have so much going on. It's just, yeah, it's just a whole world of its own. So parasitoid wasps have influenced a lot of people throughout the years. And you might recognize this picture. This is in fact, Charles Darwin. And in an 1860 uh, letter that he wrote, he said, I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the ichneumonidae with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars. Now, to summarize, that was a lot of big words. Charles Darwin was quite a religious man, and likely due to these religious beliefs, when he noticed an ichneumonidae, this is a type of wasp, feeding on the inside of a caterpillar, rather like that previous slide I told you about with all those different insects, uh, wasps feeding on the, the moth, uh, he was absolutely horrified by what he considered cruelty in nature, uh, so it shows, you know, even back then, a couple hundred years ago, these parasitoid wasps were being noticed by some of the great minds, maybe not for the right reasons. Uh, but about 60 years later in the 1920s, one of the first parasitoid wasps, Incasia formosa, that's the, the picture on the right in the bottom there, uh, a much smaller wasp than the ichneumonids, 
Uh, it was first used to control white fly, that's the bottom left picture, in greenhouses, uh, and has been since. We, we're still using it today. It wasn't as consistently so throughout the years, because I think there was a bit of a surge in chemical use during the World Wars. Uh, but you can see it's, it's still being used now, so rather ahead of its time. So we've shown that parasitoids have been used as biological controls for over a century, but why are they so useful? Well, unlike predators, which are often generalist, eating everything and anything that they come across, parasitoids are a lot more specialist. So take, for example, lady beetles. They'll eat not only aphids, but also parasitized aphids, which are actually likely tastier for them. Whereas parasitoids tend to either parasitize one type of pest or very closely related pests. Therefore, as the pest population declines, so too does the parasitoid population. And you can see this in the graph here where there's a little bit of a lag, but you can see as the aphids decline, shortly afterwards, the beneficials, these parasitoids will decline as well. They can also be purchased through a biological control company. So they're quite well available. Uh, or if they can be encouraged through good practice, you've already got them out there. So planting refuges, for example, reducing harmful chemical sprays, can increase the number of parasitoid wasps that are out there already and can be used to control whatever pest you may have. But I'm going to talk about a couple of different case studies today. The first one being passion vine hoppers, the second one being about aphids. Now, passion vine hoppers uh, are an insect that we're currently researching here at uh, Caesar Australia. They're a true bug, true bug meaning that they have a piercing and sucking mouth part. They are native to Australia and were accidentally introduced into New Zealand before 1880. You may have seen these in your gardens. They start off their life as an egg. You can see on the left hand side, that's actually a series of eggs on a little twig. They then emerge uh, into something that we call colloquially fluffy barns. You can probably see why. And then they'll molt and they'll become these winged, le a little less exciting looking insect. Uh, the, the, uh, the winged adult passion vine hopper. Now, it's probably easier to give you a list of plants that are not hosts for these pests. They have a ridiculously large, large host range. Uh, passion fruit, they're named passion vine hoppers, that's where they're from, but also vegetables, fruits, ferns, sunflowers. I can't quite work out the overlapping theme with any of these plants. They seem to like everything and anything. They feed on phloem sap. And as I mentioned before, they're a true bug. So they've got that sucker that pierces into the plant, feeds on the phloem sap, and as such secrete honeydew. Now honeydew, like its name, it's like a honey type solution, a sticky, sticky solution that you can see here on this passion fruit plant. Now in turn, this can cause something called a sooty mold. Now this is a picture of kiwi fruit from New Zealand it can be a real problem. And it has become a real problem over in New Zealand now, causing extreme uh, economic significant uh, damages really in, in kiwi fruit. However, they're not a pest in Australia. And why is that? Well, we think it's because of the natural enemies that have evolved alongside the passion vine hoppers in their native habitat. And these include things like mites and lacewings, but also parasitoids. And so, Given this is my area, this is what we focused on. And we wanted to know what species of parasitoid are affiliated with passion vine hopper across each of the different life stages. How effective are they at controlling it? And what host plants can they be found on? And this was with the intention of potentially sending these parasitoids over to New Zealand to identify a good biological control that can help them over there. So what did I do? Well, although passion vine hopper can be found in eastern mainland Australia and Tasmania, we focus on Victoria, and that's because it has a similar climate to New Zealand. And so we focus our efforts in and around Melbourne. This is a map of the different collection sites over the last year and a bit, 2021-22. And this is a map showing those sites that were positive for parasitism of passion vine hopper. So quite localised. We found the parasitoids parasitized two different life stages, eggs and the nymphs. We had a lot more luck with the eggs. Uh, 
With the nymphal parasitoids, we found one species um, at a rate of about 2.8% parasitism. And that top picture you can see here, well, it's quite exciting to actually witness. The parasitoid is developing within the nymph. You can't actually tell this initially, but it grows this sort of appendage, this little round appendage that sticks out, which is how you can tell. The parasitoid then breaks away from that nymph, walks onto, in this case, the leaf and pupates. And that's where it develops until it emerges as a winged wasp that you know it. And then the egg parasitoids, well, we read the eggs in these tubes that you can see in the bottom picture there. And really excitingly, we got what we know to be eight different species. We may even have more. Uh, we found an average of about 6.6% parasitism, but this very much varied across the different sites, anything from 0.4% to almost 30% parasitism. But we've never experienced so much diversity with these passion vine hopper parasitoids. It's never been uh, explained before, and it shows how little we know. The last study uh, on natural enemies of passion vine hopper was undertaken in the 1960s. So in my opinion, this was long overdue. So I'm going to give a quick overview of both of the, uh, the different types of parasitoids. So this is the nymphal parasitoids. And I think this is a great example of what looks like an alien. Uh, this is a dryanid, and this is the, the only parasitoid species that we reared from the nymphs. Uh, the fact that we found so little isn't surprising. We were kind of expecting this for eggs as well, uh, but we could have missed a slightly important window. So we're hoping to start the field season a little bit earlier this year, and you never know, we might be able to find some more species. Now, the egg parasitoids tell a slightly different story. And um, with the assistance of Andrew Polishek and John Noyes at the Natural History Museum in London, uh, we've identified at least eight different species of these parasitoids. And what's really fascinating is, fascinating is it shows the huge diversity that you can get just from this one, uh, one host. So, I mean, these go over three different superfamilies, um, and they're all really variable in size, but very distinguishedly and noticeably different between them. So that's a very general overview of the passion vine hopper work we have ongoing. We've got another year that we'll be starting our research again next month, uh, going out and doing another field season. Uh, but just to show you, you know, there's still so much to learn about these creatures. It's just incredible. So I'm going to move on to our other case study. And the pest of my choice here is aphids. And around 100 species of aphid are of significant economic importance as crop, crop pests. They're one of the few groups of arthropod pests that attack grains at every growth stage, meaning that they can be really quite damaging. But most of the damage is done at the seedling stage. And they can cause millions of dollars in damage in both the wheat and the canola industries, for example. And just to show you one example, because they're so variable, so many different species out there, but the green peach aphid is, is an, a species that we do a lot of work on here at Caesar Australia and that I focused on during my PhD. It's parthenogenic, meaning that it's born pregnant and it keeps reproducing. So it's, it's rather weird. Someone described it once to me as babushka dolls, where you have an aphid and inside the aphid is a smaller aphid, inside that one, and inside that one. It's pregnant with almost its great, great, great grandchildren. Very strange. But that means it can reproduce very quickly. It doesn't need to mate to produce its offspring. It can produce one generation every 10 to 12 days at 20 degrees and up to about 40 nymphs in a lifetime. So it can spread wildly. It can also cause damage in a number of different ways through honeydew excretion, like with the passion vine hoppers, because it's a true bug. It feeds on the, the plant and excretes it as honeydew. It can cause direct feeding damage. And it's also a vector of over a hundred different plant viruses such as the turnip yellows virus that caused purpling in the leaves that you can see in this picture. It's formerly known as beet western yellows virus. So obviously a very important pest for us. And in the most part, historically, but also still today, they manage by insecticides such as pyrethroids and neonicotinoids. However, the indiscriminate use of prophylactic sprays to control these aphids can lead to the development and has led to the development of insecticide resistance. For example, green peach aphid is resistant, resistant to over 100 different chemical groups. And Caesar Australia has found resistance to neonic, uh, neonicotinoids, carbamates, OPs, and SPs in green peach aphid here in Australia. 
So what can we do? This is a fight, you know, a constant battle. And so nowadays, a lot of growers are turning to integrated pest management or IPM. And this combines the use of biological, cultural and chemical practices to control pests in agricultural production. And it seeks to use natural predators or parasitoids or both to control these pests using selective pesticides for a backup only when the pests are unable to be controlled by natural means. So in the case of aphids and their parasitoids, how does this happen? Well, like I mentioned previously, adult wasps feed on nectar. So they'll, they'll feed, they'll come along, find their aphids, they'll lay their eggs inside, as you can see in the top part of that image there. The egg will then start to develop within the aphid. And after a few days, it will become a larvae. And that's when you'll see a, what we could call a mummy. And our mummy, you may be aware already, is this kind of, it's a discolored, a mummy is really how it's described. It's a discolored, hardened shell, a uh, husk almost, that this aphid's turned into and it's protection for the wasp. And then what the wasp will do is it will chew a little hole, uh, usually in the uh, posterior end of the mummy, and it will emerge uh, as a winged adult and begins the cycle all over again. The wasp doesn't actually have to mate, kind of like the, uh, the aphid, it doesn't have to mate to reproduce. However, a female wasp can only produce a male wasp without uh, mating, but if she mates, she can produce female wasps. So you, she will have to mate in her lifetime or the population will have to mate to continue that population going. If you're only producing males, the population is gonna crash. There is one genus of uh, aphid parasitoid that does actually lay its eggs on the outside of the aphid, not inside. But here is quite a cool little video you can see of an aphid parasitoid in action, shoving its ovipositor into the aphids. Now, what's quite funny actually with green peach aphid, uh, not that this is green peach aphid, but uh, green peach aphid are actually known to kick out at the wasp as a form of, as a deterrent to get, get them away. So you could, or you'll quite often hear about these wasps laying their eggs accidentally into the leg of an aphid. Um, not very successful. And this is quite this. This brings me back to the alien uh, picture that I showed you. Uh, what's actually re really weird and wacky with these wasps is they modify the behavior of the aphid. A lot of these wasps, different parasitoids actually do this with their hosts, where they basically say to the aphid, look, get under the underside of that leaf and glue yourself there. And that's to stop them from being washed off by rain and also to, to really reduce the risk of predators eating that aphid slash mummy. And so they glue themselves underneath. And one of my colleagues had actually taken one of these off. So that hole you can see at the underside of the aphid is actually where it glued itself to the uh, underside of a leaf. And you can see inside the developing larvae there of the wasp, really weird stuff. And here's just another picture. You can see here a real clear uh, chew mark at the back of an aphid from a wasp emerging. So that's a general overview of aphid parasitoids. And so, during my PhD, I decided there hadn't been a lot of work on these guys, so I wanted to have a look into them. So what I did is I looked back through all the historic data, visiting a whole load of different museums around Australia uh, and seeing what they had in their collections there. Now, the last study on aphid parasitoids was by a lady called Mary Carver. It's the lady standing beside me there in red. Uh, she did undertook this work about 40 years ago. Unfortunately, I had the honour of meeting her. And... Uh, yeah, so nothing's really been done since then. So I wanted to know how it had changed. So bringing in that historic data and also spending a couple of years collecting uh, aphids myself from grain crops and rearing parasitoids from them, I could kind of put together a picture of the diversity of aphid parasitoids in Australia. And I found that many parasitoids do attack aphids in Australia. However, the diversity is relatively low compared to other parts of the world. So we have 23 species that have been recorded and about seven genera. No new species were, were detected throughout my study. And most of them were made up from cosmopolitan species that are found around the world. So probably have just come over uh, in different, different methods and means over here. And the main one, surprisingly high, diver uh, high diversity or low diversity, but high numbers of this particular wasp was Diretella rapi. And this is just one particular species. 
out in the field, even a trained taxonomist would not be able to tell them apart there. You'd have to get them under a microscope. But it's interesting to know that there is one wasp dominating the field, basically. 70% of all wasps that I looked at historically and in the field were this one particular species and 75% um, of those that I collected with this species as well. So what I wanted to do was look at the different host associations. So in this y-axis that you can see here, these are different aphid species. And in this x-axis, this is the percentage of total parasitoids reared and the different parasitoids are listed here. But I'm just gonna focus on canola because there's quite a lot of information here. So just so you know, this top species here is the turnip aphid. The middle one here is the green peach aphid. And the bottom one here is the cabbage aphid. And you can see for each of these three species, that dark gray band that's on, um, on the graph, that's Diratella rapi. That's that wasp that I was saying, really, really dominated. And you can see it's, it's dominating for each of those, much more so than for any of the other aphid species that I looked at. Now, why is that? It's because these three species are found on canola. The rest were collected from other plants, generally wheat. And that's because this parasitoid is attracted not to the aphid itself, but to cruciferous vegetables through plant volatiles. So it was attracted to that canola plant volatile, and that's why it's so popular in this particular crop. However, for each of these three different aphid species, we can see that there's still variation in parasitoid activity. And this could be for any number of reasons. I couldn't give you a particular answer as to what, what it is. It could be due to the behavior of the aphid host. So turnip aphid and cabbage aphid are found on the racemes of the plant, but green peach aphid is found on the underside of leaves. But also green peach aphid doesn't group in the same way that the other two species do. Also, it could be due with the timing of the pest arrival. Green peach aphid is usually found earlier in the season where the other two species are found later on. And this could be to do with the weather. Aphid parasitoids have different temperature thresholds and tolerances. Now, I also want to look at, it's all very well saying, right, well, these are the aphid hosts they're on, but what about the plant hosts that they're on as well? And you can see here, each aphid parasitoid was found to parasitize a different number of hosts and reared from a different number of host plants. And the three most commonly found parasitoids, again, that Diarotella rapi at the bottom there that I mentioned before, but also another couple, Aphidius colmani and Aphidius ervi, um, which are actually commercially available. Uh, they were all found to have a really wide range of either host plants and or host uh, aphids. So you can see really why they probably would be so successful because they can just interchange between different hosts or host plants. Whereas those such as Robula scyphi, um, just above up here, will only attack one of each. But parasitoid numbers can be low when aphids are at their most damaging. So incorporating them into IPM programs can be difficult. And I found in, the, in a study during my PhD, I was uh, sampling weed paddocks and canola paddocks, that parasitism rates did reach 41% in canola, which is fantastic, but it only reached 17% in wheat at its optimum time. And this, this could be due to the fact that the broader leaves and the prostrate growth structure of the canola made it easier for me to sample. They could have been there and we just didn't know it but it does make understanding the levels of parasitism very difficult. And we found that aphid populations peaked with the parasitoids. So the proportions of mummies uh, that we found from the aphids, so mummies again, remember is when the paras uh, they're parasitized aphids. Mummies actually weren't found until November, so quite late on in the growing season. And it started at about 1% in early November of all those aphids we found, up until about 15% in late November. Uh, it was found uh, generally when, the, when it warmed up, that warmer summer months, that's when the, the parasitoids were at their finest. They also varied with crop growth stage. And this is because tall, dense crops can provide greater food and shelter. Uh, and also the preceding flower stage, the bright yellow of those canola crops can attract aphids by the color of their flowers as well. So they really peaked sort of prior to podding stage. 
So it can be late on in the season. But you do have to remember as well that these parasitoids won't really come in until aphid numbers hit a certain amount. And again, Diretella rapi was the most common parasitoid. It, it can tolerate slightly cooler temperatures than other species. And this is likely why we were finding it earlier on in the season and why potentially it's so successful. It could potentially also withstand chemicals more than we thought. There's a lot more research to be done here as well. And this is the Diretella rapi. But also during this study, uh, we know insecticide-free grassy edges, either native or weedy, can host parasitoids. They can enable them to move into crops at a distance of over 100 meters. And flower-rich edges may provide greater nectar, so food source, nutrition, than perennial crops, increasing the adult parasitoid lifespan and egg production, and in turn increasing their parasitism rates. And so we decided to sample neighboring vegetation uh, to, to different crops. And that's looking at grassy refuges and shelter belts of old gum trees with sort of varying undergrowth. And we looked at these beside canola paddocks and beside wheat paddocks. And we found that towards the end of the growing season, a lot more aphids were sampled from the canola fields than at the edge. So they were using the edge throughout sort of externally to the growing season. And then they were moving in as that crop growth stage increased. However, really interestingly, the canola, the field edges beside canola did not appear to act as reservoirs for either of the aphids or the parasitoids because there was little overlap in the community com composition of either. So the aphids we were finding in the crop were not the aphids we were finding in the, the refuge. However, for wheat, there was a lot more of an overlap. Now, this is likely due to the fact that we were sampling grassy refuges and they're very similar host plants. So a lot of these aphid species found within wheat, for example, can persist within both areas. So the cereal aphids can switch between grasses and wheat, barley, similar plants like that. Uh, if we'd been sampling cruciferous crops or cruciferous non-crop plants at the edges, then there'd be a lot more overlap, we'd assume, between the crop, the canola crop, and that refuge. However, we're gonna have to undertake further research to do this because we just didn't have enough, enough edges where they had these cruciferous crops. So that's an overview of those two case studies. I could probably talk about them for a lot longer, but I'm not gonna chew your ear off here. So I'm gonna ask the question, do you have parasitoids? It might be hard to tell. However, in the case of this, it could also be very easy to tell. But this isn't always the case. Sometimes there are no visible signs of parasitoids without rearing, so it can be really hard to understand how many you've got in the field. You can look for eggs or exit wounds on the head or body of caterpillars. You can also look for caterpillar carcasses that are full of or surrounded by pupae. You can also look for those aphid mummies that I talked about before. Again, the discolored uh, husks. You can also look for discolored eggs of caterpillars or bugs. But when you're actually trying to identify those adult wasps in the field, they can look so, well, they can be so tricky. They can look like flies. They can look like specks in the, you might think you've got something in your eye. They're absolutely tiny. So you really, there's, you really can't focus on the wasps themselves. You've really got to be looking for that activity. But we're all, often asked, we still are, uh, about how many parasitoids you need to control a particular population. So particularly with aphids, this comes up a lot. And so we decided to try and answer the question. Uh, a previous study I undertook during my PhD back in 2019 aimed to answer it. And we looked at mummies in the field, so we called them field observed, uh, and also took aphids and mummies back to the lab and reared wasps from them, and we called those lab observed. And this was for green peach aphid in canola. So if you go out and you look at your canola paddock and you see X number of aphid, uh, of mummies out of X number of aphids, you can determine a particular rate. We want to know how does that compare to if we took all of those back to the lab and reared out the wasps. And we found that the, those lab observed, those ones that we took back to the lab, it was 2.4 times higher on average than that that we found in the field. Now, we would expect this because the developing wasps in the lab are protected from poor weather, from predators. 
However, there was a lot of variation, a lot of variation across states, across paddocks, all over. And so it was really hard to find an actual sort of rule of thumb. We did find, uh, just as a trend alongside, that the incidence of total parasitoids reared uh, increased with the crop growth stage. So during flowering, it was about 3.4%, and it peaked during the podding senescing stage, about 14.4%. So again, really, really increasing towards the end of the season. We also found that there was a greater diversity of parasitoids reared towards the end of the season at those later crop growth stages. However, it didn't affect the difference between that we were observing in the field and in the lab. So there's still a lot of questions to ask. Um, you know, mummy counts, we can say, do not provide a clear representation of what's going on. Generally, it's the best we've got, and we've still got to come up with a bit of a rule of thumb. Uh, but there's so many different variables that you need to think about when it comes to parasitism. And just to confuse you, I'm going to throw this in here. Everything I've really been talking about today has been primary parasitoids. These are wasps that lay their eggs within an insect host. However, just to confuse you, it's a whole world of their own, these parasitoids. You have something called secondary parasitoids. These in include hyperparasitoids, mama, mummy parasitoids. But they will lay their egg inside the primary parasitoids that are growing inside the insect host. So they can actually be detrimental to the control of that pest. So not all parasitoids are good. Like I say, it's our own very own alien. And I could talk about this probably for weeks at a time, but I'm going to I'm going to slow down there. But I want to ask, how can you help parasitoids? Well, as mentioned previously, adult parasitoid wasps feed on nectar. So preserving native vegetation outside of paddocks can be really effective at control uh, increasing their numbers. Increasing plant diversity and managing non-crop vegetation can enhance conservation biological control in cropping systems. You can also monitor your, your paddocks, your gardens, whatever you may, may want to monitor, uh, to determine if natural enemies are keeping pests in check. And you can do this through those signs of parasitism I mentioned before. You can look for the beneficials themselves. As I say, it's very difficult with parasitoid wasps, but it is possible. You may have seen the the, in, probably in Lizzie's case, she's doing this every weekend, the pompilids, those spider parasitoids, pulling the spiders back into the, uh, into the burrows. Uh, I know I'd want the spiders got rid of, but I'm sure most people will disagree. Uh, but do, do appreciate that they do appear after a lag. So for in the example of aphids, your numbers will start to increase. They have to increase to get those wasps coming in. So if your pest population grows, do be patient. And this is the same even with aphids on your roses in the garden. The parasitoids will come in, but they won't come in at the very moment that the aphids come in. And also use selective insecticides and be judicious when using broad spectrum insecticides, because this is how we can get resistance in aphids, but we can also kill those parasitoids that we're wanting to increase. And that brings me on to some work undertaken by my colleagues, Kathy Overton and Robert McDougall, where they looked at the effects of different chemicals on, uh, on different beneficial insects. Um, and you can see there the softer and more selective chemicals are listed at the top in green. Um, and the one thing they did find, just to bring in uh, predators here, is rove beetles, hoverflies, and spiders seem to be very hardy. But there was quite a bit of variation in the aphid parasitoids. And this is because we tested multiple species. Aphidius colmani, Dirotella rapi, Aphelinus abdominalis. These are all commercially available and they are found in the wild as well. Uh, but we did find that they were similar in response uh, in some regards to the egg parasitoids, which are generally negatively affected by chemicals. So really do bear in mind what you're spraying your crops or your gardens with. Um, but this table is available on our website. Um, and you can use this to make informed choices about the less toxic chemicals you can use. So if you haven't got time to go out and monitor, then you can select a chemical here that has general low to toxicity across all the different groups. Uh, however, if monitoring is possible or you have good, good local knowledge of the beneficials you have, you can tailor your chemical use to those local beneficial populations. Uh, and in turn, you can use this table to develop IPM programs that incorporate both the chemical and the biological control components. 
And this is actually just the start of what we're doing. So further work is ongoing now, looking at sublethal effects as well. So you've helped the parasitoids, but I've got to put some final ask of how can you help us? Um, have you got any parasitized aphids? If you have, I'd love to receive some from you. Um, we have some packaging instructions that I think uh, Lizzie is going to pop into the chat at some point. Um, but you can send me an email, have a chat with me about it. It would be great to get some. Um, but also a massive passion of mine, those fluffy bums I mentioned, the passion vine hoppers. Uh, we're coming up really now to the start of the season where you'll start seeing nymphs, those fl actual fluffy bum, that, that um, nymphal stage of those uh, hoppers out in mostly in gardens, um, but wherever and ever, ever you might be. Um, so if you're in and around Melbourne, I do ask, and you, if you see them, could you please contact me? Um, I'd love to get out sampling and seeing if I can get some more wasps out of these guys. So this was actually three different big projects that um, have occurred over multiple years with lots of different funders involved. Uh, so I just want to say a big shout out to everybody who helped. Um, it's been a lot of work, but it's been some fun work and I'm always keen to work with these guys. Uh, so yeah, I hope I've uh, excited you all about our very own aliens. Thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Sam. It's always an absolute pleasure to hear you talk about this research. And um, I'm sure for those who didn't know very much about parasitoids to start off with, you've blown their minds. <laughs> um, I do have a couple of questions in the chat and we you finished perfectly on time. So we've got time for a couple of quick questions. The first one, which I attempted to answer, but you might have some more um, thoughts on, were whether there are any um, parasitoids for the Australian processionary caterpillar I thought that there was a fly that they sometimes use, but I'm, um, but I, I, I don't think they're commercially available. I didn't know if you know anything more about them. Yeah, I don't know to be honest. Um, the lepidopteran uh, parasitoids are slightly out of my field, but I can certainly find out if I, if we can just note down who who wrote that in. Um, I can I can get back to you. I'll have a look into it. It wouldn't yeah. surprise me. Generally speaking, if there's an insect pest there's a parasitoid but I do agree with Lizzie I would doubt I would highly doubt that there'd be something commercially available yeah uh, and another question was when talking about aphid parasitoids is it always one egg per aphid or is it like with the lepidopteran parasitoids where you can have multiple eggs per in one aphid yeah so I didn't go into this too much because it can get very complicated you can get super parasitism multi-parasitism where you can actually have multiple eggs being laid where one will eat the other one <laughs> um, as they're developing uh, with aphids though you'll only really ever get one one wasp actually emerging so even if there's multiple eggs in there one will outcompete the other not enough food for multiple wasps no no they're pretty small aphids and you if you ever see them it's it's pretty hard without them being that lit but you can actually see if you ever collect one out there um and even if you've got like a hand lens or something when the wasp is at its full adult stage, it's just sort of really hunched over and taking up the entirety of that aphid's body. And, and the funny thing is as well, is they'll sort of grow to the size of that aphid. So if you've got a big aphid, say a pea aphid, um, the wasps generally will emerge bigger, but they'll fill it to the, the very edge. There'll be no space left. <laughs> Gross, thanks, Sam. <laughs> Um, we've got a couple more minutes. If anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask a question or wanted to ask a question in the chat, then um, I'm sure Sam will have a stab at it. Uh, we have one more. What would you recommend to target grapevine apple moths that are, that mm. are currently available? I don't know anything about apple moths. No, it's, that's a new one. Um, yeah, I couldn't tell you. Commercially available. So, Helly, I did put a link previously for the Bugs for Bugs group. Um, so they're one of the main commercial suppliers of just grapevine moths, not grapevine at all moths. <laughs> um, again, it, so grapes is not our main area of interest. We work a lot in grains, but that Bugs for Bugs team are the ones who commercially raise these species. Um, so check out their website. They've actually got a really nice website that outlines all the different species that they breed. Um, otherwise, Sam, I don't know if you have any other suggestions of places where people can search out information on parasitoids. Yeah, no, I think I think that would be a good starting point. I know Bugs for Bugs, they definitely have, uh, there's a, a parasitoid called Didegma semiclausum, I think, which is a lepidopteran parasitoid, but I'm not sure how wide the host range is for that. So as I say, some of these parasitoids, you know, if they can, if they can parasitize an aphid, they'll 
pretty much be able to parasitize any aphid. With the lepidopterin, they're a little bit more complex. So that's why I'm a little bit unsure with both those questions, processionary and the um, and and that one you just said. Uh, but it would be worth starting off there. Again, I can look into it for you and I can get back to you with the answers to that. Really hoping at the end of our webinar series for um, beneficials that we'll actually have Bugs for Bugs come mm, on yeah. and yeah, do a presentation because I think, yeah, it's really leading to that with um, these sorts of presentations. That was just incredible, Sam. <laughs> I am really in wow and thinking, oh, yeah, the garden's going to have a completely different look just to me, but for cropping, <laughs> I, I find it really interesting. One of the projects that I've always had a passion about is um, planting refuge. Is there anywhere that we can go to look at that to as a general planting that, that can be done? And I also wondered when you talked about the aphids going into the center of the crop, is there something to say about having beneficial plantings um, within the crops also just? Mm. So yes, that's really good, um, good questions. I. Um... Unfortunately, I don't know of anywhere you can go. This is something I actually wanted to investigate during my PhD. I just ran out of time because I was pretty busy. Um, but I contacted someone actually from the uh, Royal Botanic Gardens and I said, is, is there anything that you'd recommend? And there have been studies undertaken, uh, particularly in viticulture, that have looked at using native plants. Um, however, uh, obviously, it's, it's not comparable to other, other crops. So... Um, no, is, is the short answer. I don't think there is anywhere that you can specifically go. Um, there are a few studies that I've seen along the way that have compared different uh, plants, but they're all sort of tied up in scientific papers, really. They're not, I don't think they're sort of widely available to the public. Um, but in terms of uh, planting within a crop, um, it's something that is used um, in, in certain crops, and it's something that definitely would be very beneficial to growers. The only thing is, is it's extremely time consuming and, um, and getting that in, it's, it's quite difficult when you're, particularly when you're wind rowing or harvesting. Um, but, but it's something, yeah, we definitely recommend the more, the more natives, the more um, non-crop post plants that you can put out there uh, it would be fantastic. The only, the only toss up is, and this is probably throwing, throwing more confusing things in, in for you is certain plants can be really beneficial, not just to, the parasitoids, but they can be really beneficial for the aphids or or okay. whatever insect pests we're talking about. So you, you've got to be careful and get, you want to get something that's great for those that has that extra floral nectar for the parasitoids, but isn't so much of a host for the insect pests where it can jump into a crop or into a garden. Um, so it's a bit of a complex one. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I've just seen it. And Andy has said in the chat, the proximity of host vegetation must be an issue. How far can they fly? Do you know? Yeah, you'd be surprised. I mean, even, and this is the thing. So even when we're sort of talking to growers and saying, yeah, in your refuge right there by the you know, neighbouring, the, the crop is important. But actually on a landscape level, it's important as well. I mean, the eight, I'm using aphids as an example, just because I've talked about them a lot today. You know, they can be blown a couple of kilometers in the wind. And therefore, you know, if you've got mummies, mummies can be dislodged from rain. They can blow as well. Um, I couldn't give you a specific distance, but we're not just talking about right up against the crop. You know, you could be your neighbors, your fellow growers down the road, your gardens next door, you know, they can all be really important. Okay, wonderful. I think we'll probably let you off the hook then, Sam. This has been absolutely yeah. wonderful as always. Thank um, and thank you so much for everyone who joined us today. As Liz said, we do have two more beneficials webinars coming up um, over the next couple of weeks. And was there anything else you wanted to finish up with? Um, yeah, thanks. Sorry, I'm just so wowed by insects. I forgot about <laughs> my job here on the side, putting um, information in. So I have put in that... Um, table that you referred to Samantha a link to that I've also put in a feedback um, just now um, if you wouldn't mind giving us your responses to this so that it can help um, feed into future webinars and also the one that you mentioned was the pollinators one if you haven't already registered we've got 32 so far registered for that one 
and I'll put that link in here. And I'll also mail the recording out to you with all these resources. So if you don't get it in the chat, you'll get it in an email. Thank you so much, Lizzie and Samantha. That was incredible. I'm really like shocked. I had no idea. And I should have because I realized what a complex sort of world we're talking about there. But thank you. Really opened my eyes a lot. Oh, you're more than welcome. And if anyone has any questions, um, you know, please my email's on one of the slides there and we can always send it around. But please don't hesitate to reach out. And if, if I don't know an answer to something, I can go and find out for you. Yep, send your requests through to me. I can forward them on if you don't have the email. Thank you so much, ladies. It's been wonderful. And thank you for joining us. And we're back on the 2nd of November for our pollinators. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.